Hello, this is Irv Shapiro with the Make With Tech channel, formerly the Dr. Vax channel. Over the last few years, I've created a number of videos about computer-aided design. You know, 3D printing things you download off the internet, or building things out of wood from plans you get from someone else, that's good fun. But creating things from scratch that go from your thoughts, from your mind, to a design, to then a 3D print, that's really exciting. To do that, you need to use a computer-aided design program, a modeling program to create your designs, your models. And today, we're going to talk about my favorite modeling programs and why I use them. We're going to cover the following topics. First, what is computer-aided design? Then we're going to talk about what I need from a computer-aided design program to solve the problems I'm trying to solve. We're going to talk about licensing models, how different computer-aided design programs are sold or protected. Then we're going to talk about different modeling approaches along with some demonstrations. Finally, we'll go through some of the top CAD programs, computer-aided design programs that I've used, and I'll share with you which ones I still use today and why. So stay tuned and let's learn something together. Okay, I'm going to switch the order from my introduction just a little bit by starting with my needs. I need a computer-aided design program that will allow me to create physical things, whether it's a toy, a big pawn for a chess set, it's potentially a cookie cutter, it's a bracket I can slide onto my desk to hold cables, it's a toy for my grandchildren. These connectors were designed in a CAD program and 3D printed. Shelf brackets, parts for broken appliances. I want to be able to take my knowledge of 3D printing and use it to create interesting things. Now, one of the challenges I have is I'm sort of a rules following guy. That means if there's a license agreement, if there's a rule, I'm going to follow it. And even if I could get away with it, if it says that I have to pay for this software, if I use it professionally, I'm going to pay for it. But what is professionally? I run a YouTube channel. I teach people things. I use computer-aided design programs both as a hobbyist, but also as a part of my teaching curriculum, and YouTube pays me a little money. Not a lot of money, but a little money. And does that make me a professional? Does that mean I have to pay for the software? Or what if I'm using a piece of software as a hobbyist, and then I say, you know what? I really could sell these things I created. Do I have to go back and pay for the software? So licensing is a big deal for me. Next, I want the tool to have the capabilities I need to make professional quality designs. So as an example, a minor addition to this model is these edges are beveled. That type of bevel is called a chamfer. How do you create that type of chamfer and is it easy to do? Some systems it is. Some systems it isn't. Next, I like to learn things by watching videos and also by reading. So I want good documentation and lots of YouTube videos about whatever software I select. Finally, I'm a Mac guy. So if it doesn't work on a Mac, 
I'm not going to use it. But better yet, many of my viewers are PC folks. So I want to select tools that work on both Mac and PC or Windows equally well. So those are my criteria. Now let's think about what is computer aided design? Well, generically computer aided design software is software that helps you create plans and models for things you're going to use somewhere else. Well, there are really many, many use cases, but let's talk about two. One is you want to create a three dimensional model. You're going to use in a video, in a film, in an image as part of a video game. Those types of modeling programs often are really good at modeling soft and flexible things like people, but also at modeling hard and concrete things like objects you'd see in a computer game. They often feel like sculpturing tools, like tools a sculpture would use with clay to model something, but they do it on a computer screen. Then another type of computer aided design program is for creating physical things, either the plans for things you might create on a lathe or with woodworking tools or on a 3D printer. And those are the types of CAD programs, computer aided design programs I'm most interested in. Now, when you go to a CAD program website, you'll notice immediately that some seem to highlight creating images, pictures. That's the first category, sort of the sculpting category. And some really show you examples of physical things, a automobile engine or something like that. So I'm going to concentrate on CAD for creating objects. Each of these CAD programs has a license associated with it. And the license says how you're allowed to use it under what terms. The traditional software licenses that I grew up with 30 and 40 years ago are now called perpetual licenses. That means you pay money for something to the author, to the company that created the software, you get the right to use it. You don't get the right to resell it. You don't get the right to give it away. You get the right to use it. Then potentially you pay more money every month or every year if you want updates. That's a traditional license. A newer style of license that's very popular now because really it's good for the manufacturers, for the producers of software, is a more or less a rental agreement. These are called subscriptions where you pay the money every month or annually for the right to use the software as long as you keep paying for it. When you stop paying them on a monthly basis, you're not supposed to use the software and some software, a lot of software enforces that. Then there's free software. Free software is software where the author says, use it as long as you want, it's free. Now, why would they do that? Well, maybe they make money by selling you a maintenance agreement where you get updates or you get additional features or you get support on the telephone, email, via chat. Or maybe they're just good chaps that like giving stuff away. And then the last category is called open source. In open source, not only do they say you can use the software, but they give you the programming language that was used to create the software. So you can change it any way you want, generally as long as you give your changes back to the community. Now, why would somebody do that? Well, generally it's a group of people that come together and say, we need something for our industry or for our hobby or for humanity. We want lots of people to contribute. So we're gonna do it as a community project and make it open source. The disadvantage is there's really nobody typically in charge. And so since a lot of people are contributing, once the first release comes out, it might be a while before you see a next release or there may be people that take a copy of it because anybody can and they fork it. That means they make their own copy and you have competing projects. So it can get messy, but it also can be very powerful. I tend to, for the Make With Tech channel, 
want to use either free software or open source software. So all of my viewers, independent of their economic position, can use the software I recommend. Now, if you're doing this professionally, there's nothing wrong with perpetually licensing or subscribing to software and using it as part of your business expense. But for many of my viewers, they're hobbyists, I often recommend either free or open source software. Now, when producing physical objects, there are a number of ways you can do that. The first is, I refer to as direct object manipulation. In that case, you'd take a sphere, you drag it onto your screen. Maybe you take another sphere, you drag it onto the screen. Maybe you take a third shape and you manipulate it. You more or less glue them together to create your object. We're going to look at a wonderful program called Tinkercad as an example of that. But the problem is, much like building things with Legos, if you go to want to change something on the bottom of your model, it's a problem. Everything's sort of going to collapse. You might have to redo a lot of stuff. So direct object manipulation might not be great for complex models with many parts that have to be very precise. The next style, style of modeling is modeling where you draw a drawing and maybe you then extrude it or expand it into 3D, but you manipulate those lines directly. And much like the first example, it doesn't track really a history of everything you've done. So much like that first example, if you want to change something later, you might run into problems. SketchUp is an excellent program that was originally designed for architects. You see a lot of woodworkers using it now. And that's where you directly draw things and you extrude them and you manipulate them, but it's not creating a history. CAD programs that create a history of everything you do, step by step, and let you basically replay the history, make a change and replay the history, are called parametric modeling programs. So let's start with Tinkercad and just show you how you'd manipulate objects. Then we'll talk about how parametric modeling works in a little more detail. So let's look at Tinkercad first as a direct object manipulation program. So if I want a box, I drag a box onto the screen. Then I can make the box bigger by manipulating it directly or by changing these parameters on the side. So if I want it 28.5 millimeters, I can set it to 28.5. So I can do things relatively precisely. Now, if I want to add another shape to my model, I just draw it onto the screen and I can move it around in different places. So if we make this one a little bit taller, I can move it around here and you'll see it through our cube. I could then select both of these objects and I could group them together. And now I have an object, a cube and a cylinder. But I can do something else very powerful. I can change one of these objects, in this case the cylinder, from being a solid to being a whole something I'm going to cut out of my box. So I'll change it to a hole, and then I'll regroup them together. And we've just cut out a notch in this box. So very, very easy to use. I recommend if you've never used CAD, you start with Tinkercad, because you'll learn about the idea of creating a part by taking basic object shapes and combining them together and either adding shapes together or cutting one shape out of another. But much like Tinkercad, if I build up a complex model, I want to change something at the bottom, it might break. So now let's look at parametric design. And to do that, I'm going to show you a program that's not graphical at all, but it'll introduce you to these concepts. So here, we're looking at OpenSCAD. 
OpenSCAD is a scripting language. It's like a programming language where you define steps you're going to take to draw a shape. So as an example, right here in the beginning, these double slashes mean that's a comment. I'm gonna take those out and I'm going to say, draw this. And you can see here that we just drew a cube. If I change this to 40, so all sides are equal, we now, instead of having a box, have a cube. Great. Now, this is lined up right now on the origin of my drawing. It's at point zero, zero. Think of it as X, Y, and Z, zero, zero. I can move that to someplace else by adding a command in front of it that's a constraint. It's moving, it's constraining where this box is going to be drawn. So I'm gonna move it 10 over along the X axis. So let me take and comment out this one and say translate, which is the open SCAD way of saying move, and we'll move it over. So you'll see it moved over. I made it a little smaller, so let's make it the same size so you can see it in the same position. And now it's moved over. I wanna move it a little more. I can move it a little more. And every time I have these two steps together in my defining the parameters of my object, I can replay them over and over again. Now, in these steps, you'll see I have X, Y, and Z. Instead of putting X, Y, and Z in these, I can save these in variables. And so in this next example, I'm going to set X, Y, and Z. And this time, I'm going to add another step called a difference. Difference just says cut one object out of another. The second object in my list will be cut from the first one. So I'm going to draw a cube. I'm going to draw a cylinder. And I'm going to cut the cylinder out of the cube. And where am I going to position the cube and the cylinder? Well, I'm defining those with these parameters. So now if I render this, we'll see here, I have my cube. Let's increase the resolution here a little bit. You'll see I have my cube with a nice hole in the middle. But unlike Legos, because they're all based on parameters, I can change any of this. I can move this over to position 15 and down to position 10, re-render this, and you'll notice the circle stayed in the right place. I can move this down so it's flat on the bottom of my drawing surface, and the circle stayed in the right place, the cylinder stayed in the right place. That is the power of parametric design. Now, I use OpenSCAD, and I'll explain why a little bit later, but for many people, they want something that's more graphical. So how do you get the advantage of parameters all done graphically? Well, you use a traditional parametric CAD program, and I'm going to show you FreeCAD. So let me switch to FreeCAD here, and I'm going to create a body Think of that as a basic, as a three-dimensional shape. And the way I'm going to create a body is by drawing a two-dimensional shape and extruding it. Or in the case of FreeCAD, it's called padding it. So I'm going to create a sketch. I'm going to put it on a plane. We have the X, Y, and Z planes. I'm going to put it on the X, Y plane. And let's very quickly take and draw a box, whoops, and I'm going to define that this point and this point are centered on the origin. That's called a constraint. 
So I'm going to say they're symmetric on the origin. Then I'm going to find that this line and this line are both equal. So now I've defined a square. I can make it bigger and smaller, but it's always centered on the origin and it's always a square. Because they're equal, if I define one length, just the length of this axis, say 60, it turns green, and now I can't move it at all because it's fully constrained with parameters. And all of the parameters are displayed in my model. So let me go and close this sketch. And now I can turn it into a three-dimensional object by padding it. And I can make it different sizes. As an example, I can make it 40 high. Now, it's fixed in space based on where the sketch is fixed. I can go back to my model and I can go back to my original sketch and double click on it. And if I change this to 30 and say OK and then close this, FreeCAD is going to replay those steps. So it has the sketch and then the pad and now it's changed. Now what if I want to put a circle in the middle? Well, I can do another sketch. Right now, let's turn on the origin. You'll see this is built above the XY plane. I'm going to build it down below so I can do a sketch on top so you can see it easier. So I can go to my pad here and I can say that it is reversed. True. And now it's below. So I can put a sketch on the top here which will make it easier for us to see. So I'm going to say that I want to create a new sketch on the XY plane, that same plane right here. And I can see my model underneath, so it makes it easy because I have a nice reference point. And let's, just like we did before, let's create a cylinder. So I'm going to start on the origin and draw a cylinder there. It might be a little bit hard to see, so to make it easier to see, I'm going to turn off by hitting the space bar that design underneath. Now I can take this particular circle and I can constrain it. I'm going to constrain the diameter to 20 millimeters. I'm going to close my task. I'm going to turn my pad back on and we'll see we have the circle centered on the same point in the middle here. And now instead of padding it, I'm going to pocket it. Let me select the circle and I'm going to go to tasks. I'm going to create a pocket and you can see that goes five millimeters down. So let's make it go further down. It doesn't matter as long as it goes through. And now we can see that I have a circle cut through my box. But I can always change it and things will stay in the relatively same places. So I can go back to my original box and I can say that it is now 50 millimeters. Close it and you'll see everything updated properly. I can go to this diagram and I can say that this is 40 millimeters. Close it and you can see it updated properly. So that's the beauty of parametric design. So we talked about Tinkercad, an example of direct object manipulation more or less like stack, stacking building blocks that a child would use or Legos. Very easy to do, very, very quick. We talked about OpenSCAD, which is an example of parametric design done with language 
and we just looked at FreeCAD, which is parametric design done with graphic manipulation. Now, let's go through some more examples and tell you the pluses and minuses of each and where I use them. So, we've already spoken about Tinkercad. As I mentioned, I think it should be the first CAD program everyone uses. It just helps them understand the concepts. The concept of CAD is not drawing a very, very complex drawing and then magically turning it into 3D. All CAD consists of creating basic building blocks, combining them together where some are used in combinations, some are used to cut one shape out of another. And you do that step by step by step. Tinkercad is completely free. It is used by literally millions of students in schools all over the world. So I think it's very unlikely that model is going to change. Probably the best 3D CAD system for creating solid objects that I've ever used is Fusion 360. I find it easy to use and very broad in its capabilities. But there's a caveat. Autodesk, the people who make Fusion 360, by the way, they also make Tinkercad. In the case of Fusion 360, they keep changing their licensing rules. So today, Fusion 360, an annual license is $495. Now, a few years ago, I actually paid for that license. I actually paid for it a couple years in a row because I thought it was an excellent program for creating things for 3D printing. But then I realized it was a lot of money for many of my users. So they're unlikely to use it. And even using some of the revenues from YouTube, I just thought it was too much. So I looked into their free option. They have a free option for hobbyists, for non-professional use, but they changed the free option over the years. They've reduced its capabilities and they require you to reapply to get a free license annually. So I've stopped teaching Fusion 360 and using it for my own use. If you're using it professionally, excellent, excellent tool. It's a tool I'd recommend for many people that are doing modeling for 3D printing, printers professionally. SketchUp. A lot of people love SketchUp. But look at the picture here. What's it showing as an example? An architectural rendering. And while it can be used for 3D printed objects, that's not where its heart is. So that's primarily why I don't use it. There is a free option of SketchUp that works quite well. And it's not as expensive to upgrade to various paid options as Fusion 360, but its heart seems to be in the wor world of architecture and not the world of solid 3D modeling. What about Onshape? Onshape's been recommended by many people in the comments on other videos. It's an excellent program. The commercial license for Onshape is $1,500 a year. That's just too much expensive for me. Now, I may qualify for the free option, and the free option is very creative. You can use Onshape for free as long as you only publish your models in their cloud available to everyone. So you're truly in the open source modeling space. Very creative, very interesting idea. But what happens if I create a model and it ends up really good? And then I decide I want to sell the model or sell the goods I produced with the model. Do I have to pay for it? Seems complicated. My rule following mentality was just was not a good fit for me. Next is probably a program most of you have never heard of. It's called Matter Control by the folks at Matter Hackers. Now, Matter Control is an all in one program that does modeling, slicing, and controlling of 3D printers. I think it's a really interesting way for people to get started in 3D printing that only want to have to learn one thing. Instead of learning a CAD program and a slicer, they learn one thing. Fortunately, the CAD side 
of matter control is clearly actively being developed, but it doesn't quite feel polished yet. It's a little complex to learn. Now I'm going to be doing some matter control update videos sometime in the next few months as it becomes a little more polished. So it's something I would track. It's something I would look for. It's a cross between direct object manipulation and parametric design because it does keep a complete history of what you've done. History doesn't always work right when you change things. So I want to learn the ins and outs better at something I would consider if you're looking for an all-in-one solution. Next, three programs that I don't use. The first two, Design Spark and Alibra, I don't use because I'm a Mac guy and they only run on PCs. They both have a number of fans. They both seem to be competent. Alibra is a newer offering. Design Spark is an older offering. Um, I really just don't use them because I'm a Mac guy. And then Blender is more of a sculpting program. If you look at the front page, it's designed for more for artists. Yes, you can use it for 3D printing. I wanted something designed for solid object modeling. That brings me to the first parametric modeling program I shared with you, and that's OpenSCAD. Where do I use OpenSCAD? Well, it's so easy to share a model with anyone because it's just a program, it's a script. You share that script with someone, they have your model. It also has a remarkable capability. You'll see on the right of the screen here where you can set it up where an end user, someone who doesn't know anything about the scripting language, can just change some parameters to change your model. So I have a model for a shelf bracket that I share with people. I have it published on Thingiverse. And Thingiverse has a feature called the Customizer that lets you manipulate open SCAD models. Unfortunately, the Customizer doesn't work all the time, but you can always download the model, open it in the open SCAD program, and change the parameters. So if I want to share a relatively simple model where I want people to be able to change it on their own without learning a new graphics program, I use OpenSCAD. Finally, the program I use the most is FreeCAD. FreeCAD is really a bit of a Swiss army knife of open source computer-aided design, specifically designed for the engineering of the side, the making stuff side, versus the visualization, pretty picture side, of computer-aided design. It's completely open source. You can download and look at the program. You can modify it. You can create your own forks. And there are really a lot of people working together to make it possible. Up until the last couple of years, it was a little rough around the edges with version 0.19, which is the current release. It's really quite good. Some of the things that make it so good are its ability to integrate components, sets of tools from other people other than the core developers. Those sets of tools are called workbenches. It's also very easy to record macros that combine a bunch of steps together. Both the workbenches and the macros can be written in a programming language called Python, which is a little easier than, than C++, the language at the core in the guts of FreeCAD. So if we look here, you'll see these are some of the standard workbenches that are built in. And if we go here to Tools Add-on Manager, you'll see there are quite a number of very interesting workbenches that help with specific things. A workbench for 3D printing tools, a workbench for doing curved surfaces. There are also a number of macros. And in all cases, the source code's available. So if you want to change it, you could. So for most hobbyist non-professionals, I find FreeCAD is an excellent choice 
because it's broad enough to handle many of your needs, but it also is completely free. You'll know it will stay free because it's open source. Now, if I was a professional using it every day for my business, I would probably use Fusion 360. So in summary, learn CAD on Tinkercad. Great way to learn. You want to understand parametric design or you want to create simple models and you're comfortable with something that looks like programming, Open SCAD is wonderful. For most people, building things a little more complex, as a hobbyist, as a non-professional, I highly recommend FreeCAD. Well, folks, I hope you learned something today. If you did, please click on the bell, subscribe to the channel, go ahead and share this video with everyone you know who might want to learn about computer-aided design for the first time because we do cover some of the topics, some of the basic ideas, in addition to introducing you to some of the programs. Thanks so much for watching and let's continue to learn things together.